In this part two of my documentary on the history of motorcycle racing, I'm going to be talking about the basic technologies developed in the early 1900s, moving all the way up to World War II. Now let's roll the tape. The first production inflatable tires were made by Scottish inventor John Boyd Dunlop in 1888. He originally made them for his son's tricycle out of canvas bonded with liquid rubber. Realizing how efficient they were on a tricycle, he later fitted them to a bicycle and the rest of course is history. Some other tire manufacturers you may have heard of started their bicycle and or automotive tire business soon thereafter, such as Goodyear in 1898, Michelin in 1889, Pirelli in 1890, Metzler in 1892, Continental in 1898 and Firestone in 1900. Since the original motorcycles made were essentially modified bicycles, all production motorcycles, including the first Hildebrand and Wolfmiller, had inflatable tires. The very first motorcycle tires were between 22 to 28 inches in diameter and 1.5 to 2 inches wide. The wheels were spoked made either entirely out of metal or metal and wood, and the tires used inner tubes to hold air. As the engine displacement and weight of the motorcycles grew, so did the tires width. By 1914, Indian motorcycles used 3-inch tires on 28-inch rims. These tires were constructed with a cross-ply or bias tire construction, with body-ply cords that extend diagonally from bead to bead at an angle between 30 and 55 degrees, with successive plies laid at opposing angles, forming a criss-cross pattern to which the tread is applied. Before 1915, motorcycle tires were highly sensitive to ultraviolet light or sunlight. The tire manufacturers discovered that by adding carbon black, the tires had greater resistance to sunlight and also got better thermal stability. This is why tires before 1915 were white in color, which is the color of natural rubber. Now tires of the time were also very flexible due to the clincher interlock system that they used to attach the tire to the rim. This led Michelin engineers to try and find a solution, which they did using wired on beads which used steel loops embedded in the tire's edge to prevent it from expanding under pressure. The solution was implemented by all manufacturers in the common years, and by 1930 all motorcycle tires and rims were designed in this way. Another limitation of the tires at the time was the use of only natural rubber. But in 1909 German organic chemist Fritz Hoffmann discovered synthetic rubber, Natural rubber had great mechanical performance at constant temperatures, but is thermally unstable. The cross-ply or bias-ply construction of the tires were severely flawed by the fact that as the sidewalls flexed, they generated loads of heat. This would be solved by US inventor Arthur W. Savage in 1915 for car tires, by having the cord plies arranged at 90 degrees to the direction of travel, or radially. Michelin would commercialize the idea for car tires in 1946, but radial motorcycle tires were not implemented until 1983, thus highly limiting motorcycle tires up until that time, by the fact that hard rubber had to be used as not to overheat the tires. Bias ply tires is still used for some motorcycle tires to this very day, with the advantage of being able to carry heavier loads and thus used for touring motorcycles and Harley Davidsons. Between World War I and II, manufacturers started experimenting with smaller diameter wheels, which made the motorcycles easier to steer but required another important solution to be developed, the suspension. The first type of suspension developed for motorcycling was the front suspension. One of the early pioneers was the Scott Motorcycle Company from England. They developed an undamped telescopic fork as early as 1908. Their suspension solution in combination with a powerful two-stroke engine gave them the Senior Isle of Man TT wins in 1912 and 13. Indian invented a trailing link fork, which suspends the wheel on one or several links, with a pivot point forward of the wheel axle. 
Harley-Davidson instead opted for a leading link fork, also called a Springer fork. A leading link fork has the pivot point aft of the wheel axle. Both the trailing link and leading link forks had two major drawbacks. The first being that they had very limited amount of travel, and the second being that the front wheel could go out of alignment with the rear wheel, because the links are independent. After World War I, German aircraft manufacturer BMW was forced to find another business. They were banned from manufacturing military products. They decided to move into the motorcycle and car businesses. BMW's first successful motorcycle was the R32, very similar to this R37. Now they copied the trailing link fork that Indian had developed. BMW continued to develop new suspension solutions, and in 1935 they introduced the R12 and the R17, which had hydraulically damped telescopic suspension up front, which is what most modern motorcycles today are equipped with. Another type of suspension used at this time was the girder fork, which consists of a pair of uprights attached to the triple clamp by linkages, with a spring usually between the top and the bottom triple clamps. The girder and telescopic fork shared similar drawbacks, namely that the wheel is at the end of a meter-long lever, which twists the steering head. However, the forks themselves bend too, which can be solved by making them larger. But this adds weight, which is also unsprung. This adds to the inertia of the wheel and fork slowing their response when they hit the bump. It would take until well after World War II for the telescopic forks to be almost universally adopted. Rear wheel suspension was not as commonplace as front forks, but manufacturers used racing to experiment with solutions. The 1913 Indian Single utilized a swing arm suspended by a leaf spring, and the 1913 Pope had wheels supported by a pair of plungers which were each suspended by a coil spring, called plunger suspension. A plunger suspension was used by most manufacturers all the way up until the 1950s. While the plunger design was popular, it was plagued with several fundamental flaws. The biggest flaw being that the plungers could flex independently, which would make the wheel tilt to one side or the other, making the motorcycle unstable. Another flaw was the straight line vertical movement of the wheel considerably tightened the drive chain, which in turn limited the amount of wheel travel the system could allow. Another solution was created by company Air Springs Limited already in 1908, which used a swinging fork or swing arm where a triangulated frame transferred movement to compress a single pneumatic spring mounted in front of the swing arm. The idea was way ahead of its time, but it was not very successful, likely due to the fact that the seal required for that suspension to work properly could not be manufactured to the tolerances needed, which meant that it could not have worked for any long extent of time before the seal needed to be replaced. Later on, British racer Charlie Collier, who as you know won the first ever Alleman TT, developed upon this design with his 1929 matchless silver arrow, using a cantilever swing arm with two springs and a friction damper beneath the saddle. Another British racer and Alleman TT winner, Howard R. Davis, used this solution when he teamed up with motorcycle designer Phil Vincent for the Vincent Rapide. Vincent had been experimenting with the solution already in 1927. The swing arm solutions of the time before World War II and years thereafter were limited for off-road usage with a maximum travel at around 4 inches. Compare that to a 2018 Yamaha YZ450F dirt bike with 12.5 inches of rear suspension travel. It would take until the 1970s for manufacturers to drastically improve the rear suspension on motorcycles. This is why vintage dirt bikes have such a distinctive look as compared to modern ones. The development of swing arm and rear suspension was largely driven by the evolution of frame design. As engines started getting more powerful, the bicycle single loop diamond frames used would start cracking and sometimes even falling apart at speed. This led manufacturers to start experimenting with different frame designs. The area that needed strengthening the most was the part holding onto the engine, or the cradle. So one of the first evolutions of the frame design was the semi-duplex cradle frame, with two tubes running in tandem to the wheel spindle lugs. This frame design is used for some motorcycles to this very day, especially ones that prioritize style over high performance. 
The next step in frame evolution was the duplex cradle frame, with cradle tubes extended upwards to the steering head, designed to counteract the twisting forces created by the front suspension. A frame way ahead of its time was developed by Harley Davidson in 1916, who used the engine as a stressed member in their 8-valve racer. It would take many years before this design would be used successfully again. All successful racing motorcycles at the time used spoked wheels. But another solution way ahead of its time was developed in 1927 by Czech motorcycle manufacturer Bermerland, the cast wheels. Unfortunately, Bermerland closed down and never restarted at the outbreak of World War II. It would take until the 1970s for cast wheels to make a comeback in racing. Another groundbreaking solution was the disc brakes, which Douglas motorcycles were experimenting with on their motorcycles in 1923. In fact, Tom Shirt won the Isle of Man Senior TT on this very motorcycle. The problem with disc brakes at the time was the limited choice of metals that could be used as the braking medium acting on the disc. Furthermore, the poor state of the roads at this time made the materials used wear down very quickly. For this very reason, manufacturers did not start to use disc brakes until the 1970s in racing. The very first brakes used for motorcycles were spoon brakes in 1902 soon replaced by band brakes in 1909, which used a band contracting around the outside of a drum. By the 1920s, most motorcycles had drum brakes, which uses friction caused by a set of shoes or pads that press outwards against a rotating cylinder called a brake drum. They had the advantage of being better protected than disc brakes, and thus were the solution of choice for almost all successful racing motorcycles from the 1920s into the 1970s. From 1911 until 1939, the average speed of the Isle of Man Senior TT winner increased almost linearly from 47.63 to 89.38 miles per hour, clearly indicating how fast motorcycle technology evolved during this time. 